and my name is Christina Zuniga. I'm the president of HILA this year, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Judge Lina Hidalgo. Judge Hidalgo was elected on November 6, 2018, and took office as Harris County Judge on January 1, 2019, the first woman to do so. On March 24, 2020, only a few months into her second year in office, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Judge Hidalgo issued her first stay-at-home order, closing most businesses and directing residents to stay home. On May 25th, George Floyd was killed, sparking nationwide protests, including several in our city of Houston. On July 25th, Hurricane Hannah made landfall in Texas, the first since Harvey, reminding all of us in Houston of the hurricane risk we face. Throughout all of this, Judge Hidalgo has been leading our county. Born in Colombia and only 29 years old, Judge Hidalgo is a product of Houston Public Schools and obtained a bachelor's degree from Stanford University. Like many of you, she is a bold and tremendously accomplished young leader. Like many, unlike many of us, excuse me, she has been in charge of leading more than 4.5 million people during this unprecedented time. Hyla is honored to have this time to learn from Judge Hidalgo. Please join me in welcoming her. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to, to be here with you guys, and I can't wait to have a conversation, so I'll leave plenty of time for questions. I mostly just wanted to say thank you to you guys. I mean, so many times we make progress through victories at the ballot box, legislative victories, sometimes the picket line, the protests, you know, but truly um, many times it's, it's, it's in the courtrooms, it's through lawyers and creative and ambitious, bold lawyers. For us, you know, Christina talked about the work throughout this pandemic, the stay home order, the mask order, uh, the, the bar and restaurants order, order, that was really the first one. Uh, even the work we did on schools recently, all of that, our ability to enforce those orders to find creative solutions, we have relied so much on our legal team and on, on them finding creative avenues and being really zealous advocates for, for the entire community. Another disaster we dealt with last year was the ITC fire. That was back in March of 2019. I'm sure you guys remember the plume that was stretching across the entire county and it was the, um, the tank fires. At, at some point we had multiple massive tanks on fire. And um, I, I was reminded of that with the explosions in Lebanon this past week, because we learned, we, I mean, we sort of knew, but after that we commissioned an independent study into the um, environmental situation in Harris County, the fact that we live in the shadow of industry. And of course it came back with, with the fact that there are so many of these kinds of um, sort of dangerous situations, particularly places that are right next to homes, like the explosion that happened earlier this year here in, in Houston. And just because A, there's no zoning, um, B, the regulatory framework is very lax. Any of these companies, many play by the rules, but it's hard to make sure that bad actors don't go away get away unscathed. And so all we can do is um, a fine, you know, capped at a million dollars. And there again, the lawyers come in, you know, suing for injunctive relief, trying to find creative ways to keep a watch over this industry that we need, but that we want to make sure and we need to make sure is accountable and plays by the rules. So that's another area where we've been working really hard. And, you know, part of it was making massive investments in environmental protections, but part of it was giving our lawyers the authority to file suit quickly um, and, 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 and to sue for injunctive relief. And then obviously lawyers have helped keep us uh, in check. One of the things I'm proudest of is the bail reform that we were able to pass uh, last year that we're enforcing, that we're developing this year to make sure that people aren't in jail just because they're poor, that they're in jail because they're dangerous. And that came about um, through civil rights attorneys, lawyers that sued Harris County on constitutional claims saying that our bail practices were so discriminatory as to be unconstitutional violate the Equal Protection Clause. And so uh, that helped us 
be where we are. We're facing another lawsuit that I think is, is, is merited, you know, on our felony bail practices. And there's just so much more because we have those advocates on the civil rights side of things. And so I just want to, to say, number one, thank you, because I know that you guys, you know, whatever area of law you're in, that it makes a difference. And it's important to have people who are hungry and who are um, pushing to make things better. So much of the work you do, whether it is your usual work or the pro bono work that you do is the kind of thing that is helping us build a better community. And frankly, as you guys are starting in your legal path, you're inheriting all of the challenges that are happening now with COVID, all of the challenges that the recent months have laid bare, um, the, these racial tensions and issues that have gone unaddressed for so long, the inequities in transportation, digital access, food, all of that, healthcare access, and, and you have a hand in, in addressing that. So number one, thank you. Number two, I hope that uh, through your work, through your additional work, your advocacy, your, your, your political involvement, that, that's something you do, whatever side of the aisle you're in, that you will be engaged in politics and government because we need you. We need folks like you. So I'll just end with that and, and let the rest of the time go to questions. I'm sure that folks have comments or ideas they'd like to share and and I'm just so happy to be able to spend the time, this time with you guys. Well, Judge, that's a perfect segue to my first question. And again, I'm gonna encourage all of the people attending this webinar to submit their questions through the Q&A function of Zoom. But my question is, what inspired you to enter into public service? <laughs> yeah, so that was, um, I never thought I would do it. You know, I definitely wasn't one of the people that had a plan, you know, that knew since I was little that I was going to run for office or, um, or had the career mapped up, mapped out with that in mind. It was really the 2016 election was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back and the work that I'd done leading up to that. So I'd worked on, um, in the, the hospital system as an interpreter and I'd seen some pretty tragic things, particularly as I was volunteering in our public hospitals about the lack of access to mental health care, about the inequities when it came to access to health care more generally. I'd worked on criminal justice reform and I knew so many issues needed to change starting with bail, but also um, access to counsel and uh, generally, you know, more oversight into what kinds of programs we invested in, particularly on the juvenile side. So I saw a lot of that. I worked on a lot of that. In fact, I, I helped uh, sue the county, you know, back in the day. So, uh, so I knew things were broken. And then the, the, um, the flooding, right? I, I was here for Ike. Um, which of course was more of a wind event, but I, I saw how we were battered, heard stories about Allison. I saw the, the destruction after the Memorial Day flood, the tax day flood. And um, by the time 2016 rolled around, I thought, well, hell, it really does seem like we have a flooding program. And as far as, I'm, as, far as I can tell, it doesn't look like government is doing a whole lot about it. Why? And so I started asking and folks said, well, you know, it really, we're not so helpless against this. There are things we can do. And um, detention requirements, restrictions, buyouts, massive projects. And so I launched the campaign on that platform. And of course, about a month later, Harvey happened. So it, uh, it was all of those things that were simmering in the background that I decided I was going to deal with from the outside as an advocate, as an activist. And then with the election, I figured, well, if, if Donald Trump can do this, so can I. And clearly, I wasn't the only person with that idea. Many women throughout the country had the exact same feeling. And I just figured that I could go the roundabout way and try and make change from the outside, or I could uh, go on the inside and get change sooner. And, and then once I, I started running and I, I looked around me, I found so many organizations, so many people that were there with that same thought. It was, you know, it sort of took off from there. So our next question is related to that as well. The question comes from one of our listeners. What tools have you used to remain confident in your decisions and position as a young female judge? 
Yeah, it, it's a good it's a good question. You know, for me, the strongest thing I have is trying to keep my moral compass. You know, knowing that this this feels right. Um, when the you know campaign was going on, it was the hardest thing. Honestly, was not the fundraising. It was actually finding staff there was just this huge demand for campaign staff because so many people were running. But at the same time, a lot of the staff, certainly on the Democratic side, had gotten just burned by the 2016 election and all these terrible losses. And a lot of folks sat, sat it out. They were like, we just, you know, I need a minute. And so supply and demand weren't lining up. Um, but but we may, you know, figured that out, got help from a lot of incredible groups, um, managed to raise the money, did not get any help from folks who, who have any, you know, contracts or business with the county. They just, you know, I guess they were afraid that if they supported the campaign, they'd be punished. Um, after the election, pretty much the next day, all of a sudden, all these people are reaching out that they want to host, they want to host fundraisers, you know, and there's, and it's these contractors and engineers and, and people who have business with the county, the, the fundraising professionals in town that had refused to help me during the campaign were now reaching out and they wanted to do my fundraising. And it just felt weird, you know, it felt like, you know, I know there's not a quid pro quo, but I don't even want to have the appearance of a conflict of interest and it just something didn't feel right in me to say I'm going to raise millions of dollars from people who have a contract with the county or are seeking a contract. And so everybody thought I was crazy because that's how it's done, not just here, not just in Texas, all over the country, you know, local government, their coffers come from um, the reelection coffers come from the companies that do business with that level of government. And so, you know, some have better regulations and some don't. And, and so that was a decision. Honestly, it wasn't hard. I just got a lot of pushback. But when I made it, I felt great. And yeah, you know, we haven't raised a million dollars each reporting period, but we're doing pretty well um, with people that I know and they know that if they ever call me and say, hey, I gave to your campaign, we say, great, you know, your reward is that I'm in office and I'm making good policy. And so people don't even call me with these kinds of things anymore. And, and I, you know, I don't take contributions with, from anybody who is either doing business with the county or seeking business with the county. And that, um, in my mind, set the tone for sort of how I'm doing things, which is really sticking to what seems right, um, what what I know to be right, and not trying to, you know, stick up a finger and see, I, I've not done a poll, I have no idea what my approval rating is, I just am doing right by the community. And if that means I don't win again, I'm okay with that, you know, my plan was not to be in politics my whole life. But I think that people can see good government and the community, and usually it's the masses, you know, I, I won without the powers that be. So I don't need the powers that be, I need the community. And if the powers that be come along, great. Right. So um, that, that came into play with the pandemic, the bars and restaurant order early on. We were watching Seattle, we were watching New York, we were watching California. We knew that if we did things at the exact same point in the viral load as all these communities, we were just going to have the same problems. We had to do things earlier. And so I said, we've got to shut down bars and restaurants. And I fielded many calls from people threatening, you know, if you do this, you're not going to be able to win again, no one's going to support you. Um, and it really didn't phase me, you know, like, I remember exactly where I was when I was fielding those phone calls. And I was just kind of like, not rolling my eyes, but it was like, I remember, like, I looked, I was just kind of like, like, realized I was making a face that was like, where are these, like, how do these people think that that's going to get me to change my position? And um, so that's, that's the source of my confidence and my strength is knowing that I'm doing the right thing and I don't have to keep track of a bunch of flip-flopping positions or what I owe to this person or that person. You know, that's me. My staff knows that. Um, if anything sort of feels shady, feels weird, we're like, wait a minute. No, you know, and so that's, it's, it's great to be able to do that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, you have a hard job and I think sticking to your core is probably key to making sure you're, you're doing your best. So I have another question asking about being a young leader leading older, older leaders. Uh, oftentimes your older counterparts seem to be dismissive of your great and right ideas. How do you handle ensuring your voice is heard and not overlooked or dismissed? Yes, yeah, it's, it's always challenging. 
on the one hand, the more young people get involved in politics, whether it be by running for office or simply, you know, being present in that sphere, the more we sort of normalize it. And, and it's interesting. It, it is, I do think there's a gender aspect to it. Um, you know, the late great Roy Hoffines was 24 when he was elected and he's sort of the, the, the legend here when he was county judge. I was 27, so I'm actually not the youngest county judge, but when it's a young man, it's like, you know, a dashing, enterprising young man. And when it's a young woman, it's kind of like, hey, why didn't she run for school board first, you know? And so um, I think it's something that is becoming more and more normal. Uh, when when I was running, one of the folks that I, I knew very well and was sort of in the same group of, of, of women that decided to take this on, uh, Lauren Underwood, the youngest African-American woman ever elected to Congress. Um, we had kind of a cohort of, of, of just young people and you know we see so many of us i know in texas another young legislator james talarico you know just a great person um not necessarily in our area but but you just see this young young leadership which is important um and is refreshing and it's just good to have a different perspective not to say that um that the the perspective that's been here a long time is not valuable but i don't think we need to discount either and uh, you know it it show them by by doing i think we've proven a lot of the work that we've accomplished just in the past year massive projects on everything yeah from environment to transportation fundamentally changing the way the county does budgeting which is massive you know huge investments in um census justice reform uh, food access i mean just from from small to big and and so that there's just little comeback to that and then of course i have uh certain things i've learned you know there's just certain lines that i draw and 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 um sometimes when folks are disrespectful or dismissive you just kind of be the bigger person and if you're the younger one they really look bad you know so sometimes when they go on a rant i just kind of look at them and and move on and and then they look silly you know it's like um, so, you know, you learn stuff like that, but I think that that's why, partly why it's so important for us as young people to step up and not wait our turn because, um, it just, we need to, to pave that way. We need to make it normal. Yeah, the being the bigger person tip is a particularly good one for young lawyers with older opposing counsel. I've been in that position before too, where there's an older lawyer on the other side who's dismissive of me. Um, and sometimes you just have to do a good job and that's the way to prove yourself. Yeah. And, and I have a, another question here. First, this uh, listener wants to thank you for being here. We're all so appreciative. And then he asks, what has been your approach to addressing some of the misleading information and unhelpful comments that have come from other leadership on pandemic safety measures, like wearing a mask and shutdowns? Initially, with the with the pandemic um, misinformation and and more, I'll say the politicization. I I have to admit, I thought it was going to go away. So it started with um, the masks. That's when it really started in earnest. If you guys recall, when we did the restaurant bar order, when we did the stay home order, everybody worked together. I mean, it was it was beautiful. It's hard, but it was beautiful. And I and it's it's achievable. That's how they did it in other countries and other communities. People work together till the curve came way down and then they reopen and it's kind of, you know, it's people are frustrated, of course, but it just sets you up for more sustainable success. When the mask order came out, that's when some folks really started trying to to sow the, the seeds of, of dissent and and politics. And we were being just pummeled, you know, our inboxes, our social media. And I said to the team, you know, we get this kind of thing all the time. And we, I mean, of course we see it, but it's like, mm, you know, it's another day. And, um, and so I just said, look, if anybody wants to play politics, I'm happy to do that when it comes time for re-election. But right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. And I thought that that would sort of weather the storm and I was refusing to lend credence to any of that. Still, I, I sort of don't acknowledge that kind of thing. But what's sad is it has continued at the highest levels of government and it makes things very hard. I would say that those messages are a big part of the reason why the response ultimately failed and why, for example, we can't have schools right now, you know, why we, we can't safely go back to normal and is, is because there is this mixed messages uh, messaging from a public health standpoint 
right now our numbers are very bad. We should be staying home. We should be bringing those numbers way, way, way down and then starting over more sustainably. But because there's been this sort of pandering and politicking, um, people just hear different things and and you really can't blame it on the community. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's incumbent upon the leadership to give clear, consistent messaging. So that's been one of the saddest things and, and one of the biggest problems. Absolutely. Every country, every community has its um, conspiracy theorists and the people that are going to disagree no matter what. But the problem comes when the highest levels of government lend credence to that. Judge, speaking about your team, I was wondering if you could share a little about your own legal team and what they handle for you and who they work with at other levels of government. Yes, yeah, so at the county, a lot of it's the county attorney's office. And they're incredibly professional, incredibly creative. I'm just, gosh, particularly during disasters, they have been amazing. And I don't know if we have anyone on the line from the county attorney's office, but but thank you if you are. Um, so so they're really doing everything from uh, you know all the times the county gets sued to helping us file uh, an amicus brief, for example, in all of these census lawsuits or join lawsuits. Uh, there's like there's a couple of of census lawsuits actually where we're part of it. Uh, and I know we're collaborating with some firms, so it may be some of you guys are working on that as well with some private firms. And and of course, during disasters, very important and, and quick, you know, like we need to know during the ITC fire, for example, there came a point where I was like, y'all, I knew something needed to happen and it wasn't happening and I needed to know what authority had to force that, you know, and ultimately somebody else forced it. But it, it was just this this quick, a little bit slower on the pandemic, but but what in, in the in the floods and the fire, very, very important. Internally, I I do have my own legal team as well, um, just to you know, there's questions that we have specifically always want a second pair of eyes. But for us, you know, we can sort of uh, legally, we we can only really rely on the county attorney's advice in court to say, you know, this is what I was relying on when when I made the decision. So um, so it's a, it's an interesting setup, um, but thankfully we have we have a great team. You touched on this, um, but just in case you want to share more, I have a question here. Which other leaders, groups, or organizations at the local, state, or federal level do you work with to help make informed decisions? In terms of the pandemic, uh, from the very beginning, you know, picked up the phone to call my colleagues around the country. We've got a beautiful group um, through the National Association of Counties, and we meet once a year. The, the executives of the 25 largest counties. So at this point, I've met with them twice, uh, the, in December right after the election and then this past December. And, uh, and, and they're great friends to me. So when the virus was spreading in Seattle, I could call my friend Dow Constantine and say, hey, you know, you can see the future. <laughs> you know what, where we're headed. Tell me what I need to know. I've talked to the executive in, in um, Cook County, Chicago, uh, who's who's just fantastic as well, Tony Prickwinkle. I speak with the county executives in Dallas, San Antonio, Austin. Um, we are in touch with the public health teams also in Washington, California, New York. You know, so it's 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 a very much a best practices focused approach. We have a group out of Rice University of researchers and epidemiologists that we work with who are helping us look at best practices, not just in the country, but around the world. And of course, doctors um, externally that are in touch with our public health team, that we've got a, an incredible public health team, experts with all the degrees and the, and the on the ground expertise who, who help us look at all of this. So, um, you know, part of the challenge in this crisis is nobody had a playbook early on, even now, you know, nobody has a playbook. Uh, we don't have a sort of uh, something that came down from a higher level, WHO put out, puts out some guidance, CDC puts out some guidance, but, but there's not a end all be all, this is what you need to do. And so a lot of it has fallen on me to just collect all of that information, confirm that it's coming from a place of public health and not of politics. I did, you know, some of these actors, even though they're on the health side, they almost like have trouble separating the two. So I'm constantly saying, guys, okay, 
forget about how it's going to be perceived forget about the politics just in the perfect world what would you like to do you know so that's like my whole my whole thing and then being able to really extract that and then say okay th this seems right so um so 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 yeah that's how that's how we do it and, and my team internally in the county judge's office uh, is you know people who are very intellectually honest who are not afraid to say i don't know or you know this is the best we've got the best information and we just got to make a decision and um so but but yeah a lot of it is also just prioritizing you know so many things land on our desk normally from mosquito control to the astrodome to flood control and now with the pandemic it's a lot you know are you going to work on feeding on computers for students on rental assistance or continue to focus on you know testing tracing and then what should the schools do so it's it's a constant jigsaw puzzle judge i want to be mindful of your time do you have time for one last question yeah. great so um we have a couple of questions that basically ask the same thing they want to know Given the strong start in your political career, where do you see yourself going next, whether in politics or otherwise? Yeah, I, I don't have like a big, you know, ambition of like, I really want to get to this position. Right now, I want to do this job well. We need to get through the pandemic. There were problems that we were hoping to tackle this year was supposed to be about young people. We were going to work on a big early childhood education program um, for, for the county. We, which as you guys know, you know, early childhood education has the biggest return on investment of pretty much any public program. And, and we had a massive initiative around juvenile justice reform, which is badly needed. Both took a back seat. And so, you know, it's something I still want to work on. So hopefully uh, through the rest of the term, besides tackling, you know, recovering from coronavirus, we'll be able to, to go back to those issues. Um, the budget reform is not done. You know, when we got here, we realized that every year the county budget's based on what was done the year before, which is based on what was done the year before, you know, going back decades. So there's like so much room for creative pro projects and, and metrics for success and just like you know, there's like a billion dollar bridge, but people are hungry. Like you got to kind of look at it and, but there was no way to do that. So, but it's a $5 billion annual budget. So it's hard to steer that ship. So there's a lot of work left to be done there. So I'm excited to finish those projects, you know, hopefully have a second term. And after that, I don't know. I mean, I really do feel like as long as I feel like I'm being true to myself and keeping that moral compass and focusing on the issues that that the community cares about that I know are important, I'll be here. If ever that becomes, you know, impossible, that means that I lose with that approach. I, I really am okay with that. So I'm not gonna be, you know, distraught if if I have one term or uh, or, 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 or or two terms. I will say I have no interest in being in this position for 30 years. So I, I don't see myself being here for more than two terms. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you joining us today and your support of our community and the young lawyers that make up this organization. So thank you, Judge. And if you have anything you'd like to say in closing, you're welcome to. No, thank you guys so much. I'm so excited and glad to have had this time. I hope I can visit with you guys in person, you know, next year, I guess, or whenever we have a vaccine. And, and, um, and if any of you guys are, are thinking of, of running for office or getting more involved in politics, you know, do it. There's never a perfect time. And it really is important. We need folks like you. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined. I hope you have a great day.